Well, good evening, everyone. It is Monday, July the 5th, the first Monday of the month, and that means it's time for another Sonar Masterclass. Eight o'clock, of course, is the start time. I'm sorry for all those people who listen to the ALF podcast today. I think I said 7.30 was the start time. I guess it's better to get you here early than get you late. Tonight, we've got a real treat for you. We've got a gun tournament angler on board, Dean Sylvester. I'm going to get him from the lobby right now, bring him onto the show. Dean, welcome along, mate. You've been here before. It's great to have you back again. Thank you for having me on. Well, mate, we talked, I think we talked bass last time, didn't we? Can't remember, to be honest. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was bass, but this time we're going to talk barra, another species that you, you know, spent a fair bit of time on. And a lot of stuff's happened since the last time we spoke. I think last time we spoke, the active target technology wasn't available yet in Australia. Now it obviously is, and you've been spending a bit of time playing around with that. So we're going to you know, talk a little bit about how that active target stuff works and answer some questions along the way. Now, folks, you know how it goes. If you've been here um, you know, before and been to some of our masterclasses, what we like to do is start off by getting you to just uh, put a chat in the chat box there and let us know that you are getting us all right. A couple of people saying they're getting no sound. Um, Dean's getting me. I'm getting Dean, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, so Lee, uh, is it Lee? Yeah, Lee, if you're hearing us now, let us know. Uh, otherwise, I'll get somebody to scratch around. Joshua's also saying no sound. Um, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Sorry about that, guys. Um, everybody else, please let us know if you're hearing us okay. Um, there's no point in doing a whole presentation if you don't have any sound. So uh, <laughs> put some chat in the box there. Let us know if you can hear us. So a few people saying they've got sound. All good. So those guys who haven't got sound, I've got somebody looking into that. Uh, in the meantime, hopefully it comes on. Everyone's saying it's working great. Terrific stuff. All right, let us know where you're coming in from, guys. And tonight is all about asking questions. We've got a few slides, not too many. We've got a few videos, again, not too many. But what it really hinges on tonight is you asking questions that Dean can answer. So uh, let's make sure you fire those questions through. We're going to stay here as long as it takes to answer them all. And, uh, you know, well, <laughs> Dean, Dean's looking a bit worried. I know he's tired. He's had a long day. But Keep the questions coming. If we don't get to them straight away, don't be afraid to type them into the chat box again because sometimes they scroll through faster than what we can keep up. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let Dean do a bit of talking. So, mate, tell us about how things have changed since the last time we spoke. What's going on with this active target technology and how's it changed barramundi fishing for you? Well, typically everything you look at on normal sounders like side scan, structure scan, all that, it's historical data, you know, like the fish has been through the beam, the information gets processed and it's on your screen, albeit f fairly efficiently, but it's still historical data, you know. So, and with size scan and stuff like that, you know, there's fish in the area, which is typically sometimes enough with barramundi fishing. You know, they're there, so it makes you keen and boom. Not makes you keen, but you're you're aware there's been changes going on and there's now fish in the area and you know what's going on. But now with Active Target, you're not only sort of seeing them coming in, you can physically watch them exactly what they do, you know. Are they coming in straight past you? Do they come in, turn around, go back the other way? I've often wondered when you're looking at a one side scan, you might see five fish on the left-hand screen and within just as they're clearing off the screen, sometimes still on the screen, you're now seeing five fish on the right-hand screen. You're like, oh, there's heaps here, but, you know, with active target, you watch, they literally do a lap of the boat and then disappear. So it's like they come to have a look at you and go away and you're thinking, wow, there's so many so many fish here right now when literally they swam in, had a look and disappeared. Yep, yep. And we've got a question from Brady saying, is this an update for HDI 7? Uh, no, it's a bit more than an update for HDI 7, Brad. Uh, there's, there's a bit more to it than that, and we'll get into that a little bit because it does take a little bit to uh, to get your head around it. It's not like standard sonar. This is live sonar. It's, as you say, you know, if it's standard sonar, we're looking at what's been passed, albeit fairly recently, but now we're looking ahead at what's coming, you know, what's in front of the boat. So there, there are several different modes as well, aren't there? So we can we can scout forwards. What's the difference between forward scan and, and scout, mate, when it comes but to the, the active? Basically, like if you imagine the beam as being like wide and flat in scout mode. So I can now look at an area 130 degrees facing out, but mm. it's very, very narrow. I'm not looking at very much depth in the water column. Yep. Whereas when you go to forward, it's the opposite. So you've got a narrow beam this way, but now I have depth and everything like that as well. So like you're saying, it's it's um, a lot more to take in, but the, the only mode that 
takes a little bit of thinking about really is scout mode because like i said you're looking like whichever way you want but you've got 130 degree beam going out but you have no depth perception so that's about the hardest one to fish but one of the most useful is because you don't have to chase a fish you know you can watch them moving around a lot whereas forward down and those modes it's it's like watching tv you know i can see a tree and i can see a fish and i can see my lure it's all very self-explanatory and easy to interpret mm -hmm. talk to us about transducers mate because this unit doesn't run off a standard transducer you do have a, a separate transducer for it and i believe yours is fitted on a pole so you can rotate it around which seems to be a common uh, a common adaptation well you can't you can they're designed mostly american guys are, are fitting them straight to their trolling motor okay but for us, I mean, particularly a lot of us, me included, Barramundi fishing, we fish in spot lock mode. So having it on the trolling motor is painful because mm -hmm. you might, you'll have it sitting there and you'll see some fish or whatever, but then the trolling motor has to adjust for a breeze, boat position or whatever, and it takes the beam away from the fish. So hence the reason for the pole. Yep. And the pole is mounted how? So mine's just on a ram mount off the front of my boat. Okay. And it's like, um, I guess, in a slide mount. So it's free to do whatever you want with it. You can adjust the depth. And being on a ram mount with a rounded ball too, in scout mode, like I said, you're looking wide but not much angle. So what you can do is, like, push your pole a little bit forward or a little bit back to just to check in the beam or we'll check in the water column, I guess, what's going on, whether you're sort of looking above or below some fish in case you're okay. in sort of... 12 to 15 feet of water or something like that. So, so it's kind of like a 2D wedge and you're moving it up and down as you as you sort of lick, what's the word I'm after, as you tilt that pole, you're you're lifting that that beam up. Yeah, and you're also like, obviously, um, transducer is all about ping, still sonar, it's the same as everything else. Um, by tilting it as well, like using that pole to tilt it backwards and forwards, you change the shadow position and your reflection of the mm -hmm. object too. So if you're looking at a fixed structure, you can understand the fixed structure a bit more so moving it backwards and forwards. You don't really need to do that in forward mode. Obviously, like I said, you got a, you got like a slice running this way. Yep. It's very narrow, so it's and it's um like very accurate. Okay. Okay. So when would when would you use forward mode as opposed to scout mode then? Forward mode, probably a little bit deeper water, and I prefer fixed structure. Yep. So if I'm looking at a tree, for example, or um, yeah, probably just more physical structure like trees, rocks, for example. And okay. I know fish are more stable, like stationary. They're not moving as much because, like I said, with that narrow beam, yes, the precision and everything is perfect, but you'd be amazed how much fish swim around when they're in open water. And unless you've got sort of one guy steering and one guy casting, it's very hard to keep your keep the fish on the screen and the lure on the screen at the same time. Mm, mm, okay, cool. Got a question that's come through from uh, from Graham Gamble. He's asking, do you find that the active target consumes more battery than the standard triple shot transducer? Yes. So the new transducer, um, as with most new products, it's an add-on to your sounder. You probably find next generation of of sounders that technology will be able to be integrated into the unit, but um, as with most things, like when they come out, when SideScan first come out, it's a it's an extra module that needs to be powered separately, mm. um, which then powers your transducer separately and you run a network back. So I was pulling for two HCS 9s and that module and transducer, uh, I think I'm pulling like 8 amps. But what you can do if you have a 24-volt trolley motor set up in the boat is power the module itself off your trolley motor setup so you okay. can pick up a 24 volt system obviously not the not the transducer though because you don't want the interference well transducer the kit's powered off that module and it's just all through network but okay. it, um the 24 yeah. volts i've heard actually gives you um better readings more power that's that's yeah. one of the things that came up actually in in last month's uh master class when somebody asked that question do you get better results or better you know better pictures more accuracy with the 24 volt and nobody seemed to really quite know so there you go we've we've answered that one this time around well, Couple of questions. Rumor. I'm the, I'm the... <laughs> the rumor has it but um, yeah. all right a couple of questions coming through so um 
One from Brett asking about how you find the um, the uh, active target in salt water. Does it work well in salt water as well as fresh? Yeah, we used it in Inch and Brook, and it's um, basically the imagery and stuff is exactly the same. And a profound salt water uh, easier to use because the fish respond better than Moody Impoundment Barramundi. <laughs> and uh, and Scratchy's asking any tips for snapper. I've got a tip for you straight off the bat for snapper, mate, and that's just hang around because we've got another masterclass coming up uh, in, in the coming months with Lee Rayner all about snapper, but I'm sure Dean's got a few tips for you as well. No, I'll be watching that class too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd okay. love to use this, this setup on shallow reef stuff for snapper. It'd be, it'd be ridiculous. Yeah, 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 I, I agree. Uh, so James is asking, he's having questions with his HGS 12 Gen 2. Is that something we can help with? Um, you seeing dots rather than arches? Could be sensitivity, could be um, beam angle. Obviously, to get an arch, it needs to pass fully through the cone of the beam to get, the, like, as it enters, then as it leaves and when it's in the middle. So if he's only getting a dot, maybe his transducer's on a funny angle. Yep. Now, that's the easiest thing to check straight off the bat as well. It's really easy to play around with the angle of the transducer and see whether you get better results. Good, good place to start. EJ Black. So uh, when you're back in the Mackay region, Dean, and would you use forward mode in Timbra? Probably not till November. And, yeah, definitely would use. I'd probably set up – Timbra's a bit unique, I guess, the way you can fish it. You can go and chase – resident fish in there that hang around the lily pads and the, and the structure and the trees. Um, you could definitely fish forward mode in there for residents, but I've, I've found majority of the time lately, I, I set it up on in scout and I can see all the weed beds, all the weed towers, and you give yourself that, that clear run, not exactly clean, but a pretty clear run through the weeds. So you're only clipping it every now and again, and you can see that so easily in scout mode. Yeah, no worries. And we actually we did a podcast that, that went live today as well where you talked a little bit about some of that stuff. And you also talked about how you used sonar before the active target and in using the 2D uh, to decide when the, or to, to work out when the fish were biting and to, to using the, the side scan to work out where the fish were. Would you like to talk us through that while I just tap out a reply to James? Well, ba basically, so what, what we do is we run 2D and, and side scan at the same time sitting off a point. Uh, 2D is just literally to watch the bait. So you can see when there's no barramundi in the area, the, the bait just sort of like not solid pieces of bait, just like a mottling of bait. You know, you'll see that, that red and a bit of yellow through there. And it will all be very, very close to the bottom and there won't be any barramundi on the side scan. Then you'll not watch the boat. It'll literally lift from 8 to 10 foot or 12 foot on the bottom and it'll sit way up the top in that 1 to 2 feet. And it's, it's just getting out of the way of the bar of money that are mm. on the team. They, mm. they don't want to be down there with them. And they're obviously uh, they're harder to catch near the surface. You know, they don't have anything like any walls or anything. They've only really got that surface as a barrier. Yeah, yeah, great. All right, look, tons of questions coming through. So um, where are we? Let me just scroll back up and find some of them. So... Um, Christian's asking about when you're in scout mode traveling forward, what speed do you start to lose clarity in your picture? Don't know, to be honest. I haven't really gone, like I've only been really going like normal trolling mode of speed, so up to four kilometers or something and didn't lose mm. any image at all. Yeah, It's very, very, obviously live uh, feed is processed so much quicker than traditional sonar, so... To, to lose it, you'd basically have to get air or something across that transducer because it's going to pick it up and yep. put it back straight away. Yep. All right. A bit of an unrelated question, but have you got any theories about why Dan Barra get affected by tide change bite times? Well, it's more to do with the, the pull and the draw of the gravity of the moon. So I guess it's just a, an ingrained thing with them. It's like... It's like the whole full moon thing. Why does why is the lead up for the full better? If you think about in salt water systems, obviously the tides are getting bigger and bigger as as you get closer and closer to the moon. So the window for Barramundi to get onto the bait gets shorter and shorter. You know, as the as the tides gets higher, the bait have somewhere to go quicker, and they get up there. So then and then the feeding windows are a lot smaller because they're up and away from the Barramundi for all that time. 
and I guess it's just a built-in thing with with them I guess same like a lot of traits that we have like why are we why are we sleeping in the day and eating when we do and and I mean staying awake in the day and sleeping at night and eating when we do you know it's just mm. I guess some things are ingrained but yeah it's not so much the tide it's more the gravitational pull of the moon mm. yeah I don't think there's any scientific um, evidence that you know, kind of explains it, but there's enough anecdotal evidence from anglers that you know that there is an impact there or there is an effect there that it's worth paying attention to. A friend of mine uh, ran tournaments in Mackay for a while, and you have to when you catch the fish, you write down the time that you caught the fish, and it's something to do like ninety five percent of the fish in the tournament were caught within an hour yep. across the entire lake. Yep. <laughs> All right. So a question from Christian, mate. Does the unit mirror to your iPad? Yes, and your phone. So a lot of screen recordings you're about to watch and the ones that are on my socials are all screen recorded off my phone. Hmm. Yep, cool. Um, one from Katie, what's the best depth for forward mode? Anything sort of over that 12 feet that you can't – you can use a shallower. There's no real restriction for forward mode. It's more that scout mode is limited to depth. Like I said, you, you got a wedge that's – wide but flat this way so forward can be anything that you want whereas uh scout once you're in that position and you're anything you get, you're sort of going to lose the bottom so it depends on the fish you're sort of targeting but scout i wouldn't use anything sort of over 12 feet okay cool all right katie uh katie haley oh, that's we've already had that one sorry guys we'll move on to carl straight who's asking is the bait display the same as side image? In other words, does it come up as a kind of a hazy cloud on on the active target, same as it does on side scan? Not really. It depends on the size of the bait. So we've seen bony brim that are only really tiny and that you can actually literally see them like swimming around. You can see them change shapes and you can see the single the single fish and then they'll come straight across the front of your transducer and show up like casting massive shadows. So the target mm. separation on it is ridiculous. Like I can cast a little bit like this. And at 60 feet away, I can see it coming back. So Yeah, yeah. Now, Tony Tierney's asked, can anyone tell him where to buy an electric motor? <laughs> um, <laughs> which is, uh, mate, if you can get one, uh, good luck to you. They're very hard to get at the moment. Um, yeah. But if anyone does know where you can get a hold of one, just put something in the chat box there. Uh, Steve Galvin, thanks for having me on board, Steve. Says two kilometres an hour is ideal speed when searching. And uh, Steve's one of those guys who would know. Plays around with it a lot. He does play around with a little bit. Okay, so Craig Lattimore. G'day, Craig. Uh, with barrow fishing, a lot of success comes from reading the water, like looking for eddies, colour lines, tailing fish, bait, congrega bait congregations and so on. Do you find yourself buried in the active target looking at the screen and missing those things? Not really. Well, definitely not yet anyway because I'm very similar. Um, I fish a barrow money for, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so now and you can't just ignore all those basic things, instincts or patterns or theories and all that. It's more so that I use it to back up what I already know, so to speak. And I'm actually surprised, like I said, with side scan where I thought fish were moving into an area and just being difficult to catch. Now with this, I know they're not actually moving in there. They're just coming past or checking me out mm. or a combination of both. Yep. Good, good piece of information to have. Um, Phil is asking, uh, do we know when Lawrence is announcing the comp winner? Do you have that information to hand, Dean? No. Uh, neither do I. I, just I, say I, would, I would suggest <laughs> posting on the on the Lawrence Facebook page. Uh, Bill, that was probably the best bet. Now, Dean, we've got a few screenshots here. So we might pull some of those up and, and have a bit of a chat about what they're showing us. So let me just um, get us organised here. All righty. So this is obviously uh, your down scan and side scan. Yep. Tell, tell us what we're looking at, mate. Basically, what you can see on the side scan to the left part of the side, well, I guess it's left if everyone's got the same as me, but there's a lay down log and it's it's basically directly under the boat, which is what you can see on your down scan. So on the left hand side scan, you're just seeing a part of it. And then what you're seeing, so on the, I basically nearly always rely on side scan for fishing for barramundi. Like I said, I use the 2D or like down scan as in this picture for more for the bait, understanding when the bait's lifting. But so with those two barra on that left-hand image, um, 
you can see the fish and then the shadow. So that's the information that you're looking for. You don't want to just see those shadows and go, yep, there's heaps here. So those, the fish on the left, they're completely different depths. So one of them is basically straight under the boat and fairly high in the column. And he's probably the one pictured in that down scan in the highest position. And then the one that's just about to go off the screen, he's about 15 feet away and sort of three to four feet off the bottom, if that, maybe even two feet off the bottom. And he's he's the one I'm looking to target. Those mid-water ones or high in the column ones are very difficult to, to hit with a lure. Sorry, mate, I muted my microphone. Is that just because those fish are moving fairly quickly and they're, they're not um, not stationary high up in the water column? Not really. It's more so, um, like you imagine, you cast that lure out, the lure's, what, six inches long, takes um, like 12 seconds to get to the bottom, whatever, and you're slow rolling. You, the, They don't necessarily just fly over and inhale a lure like we'd love them to. You know, it's like it has to come pretty close to them and the chance of you hitting that fish that's near the bottom is a lot more likely than that fish that's mid-water. Well, he's, he's very high in the column. You know, he's probably the one that's going to smack you when you burn it back in to throw somewhere else. You're not even paying attention. Yep. <laughs> they do like to do that. Yeah. Uh, question from Mick Knowles. What transducer is this? He's got a HGS7 live and you can never get that kind of clarity. Is the fish ID off? Yeah, def there's definitely no fish ID on, on this image. And this is all um structure scan stuff so it's not 2d sonar it's uh down and side scan so i think yeah and it's also set at 800 which is what i like to run it's a higher frequency when you're running side scan so the higher the frequency the shallower the water it's going to be useful in so if you're fishing fresh water still you're much better off running that 850 800 rather than the 455. okay cool I, I rarely ever play with any of my settings. The most things I play with is um, like custom depths on my screen, that's all. All right, cool. Let's look at the next one. So basically very similar to what I was saying with the other one. You've got your, your 2D above and then your side scan. But what you notice in this one, it's he's got his contrast up just a little bit too high. It's very hard to pick exactly where those barramundi are. So, but the sort of the good part of it is, is they're not in the black section in the middle uh, under the boat. Then you notice all those smaller black dots that are floating around the screen everywhere as well on both sides. Um, that's all your bait. So this, looking at this, if I was fishing, I'd be very, very excited it's about to go down if it's not already going down. Seeing bait mixed in with the bar is perfect. I think you muted your mic again. I have. Thank you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get used to technology eventually. Let's play this video, mate, and you can uh, talk to us as it, as it plays. So we learn a lot when we uh, did this in this particular day. So we're jigging vibes out on these barrel that we can see and uh, – very, very, very frustrating. <laughs> They're obviously, um, like I like to target barramundi where they move into a feeding position, like those images you looked before. Um, these fish, we found them out in the open um, in Kinshin, actually. So they're not, they're not in feeding mode. They're just out there and we just um tried to pester them with lures to get a bite and you could get them to come have a look and i did get one or two to, to smack it but they're just not interested uh, you can see how easy it was though to literally put that fit put that lure precisely in front of that fish you know like we saw him swimming there so i dropped it straight down under him probably startled him by the looks of it and then uh, he's had another look and turns away and then goes back has a little sniff of the other lure and then no he's out of there He's had enough of this game. He's played this game before. <laughs> and that was one of the things you said when we talked in the podcast the other day as well, is that you know, one of the challenges with the active target is teaching yourself not to put the lure too close to the fish and, and not, not to spook them with the lure before they uh, you know, get the chance to realise that there's something going on. 
Well, I've sort of always had that mentality, which is what weird why I don't do it when I fish with active targets. So my whole principle, especially bass fishing, has been to not give the fish the opportunity to look at the lure properly. And it's very similar to what I do with barramundi fishing is I try and keep that lure tracking within six inches of the bottom or less so that they can't physically see it. They can sense it. They know it's below them. And it's really difficult to get an eyeball on it. They're forced to like sort of trigger to do something with it if they want to have a better look at it. Yet when I fish with active target now, I'm so tempted to put it in front of their mouths, which <laughs> goes against everything. Yeah, it certainly does. All right, let's move on to the next little video here. So, so this is the same. This is a fixed structure, though. That's a. It's a bit hard to tell because it's, it's basically just a vertical tree, but it's there's barramundi all over it everywhere. So you can see two or three hanging on it. We're jigging vibes straight up and down. I'm actually bringing a lure across the top of the screen straight towards so I speed it up to try and get to that fish and he just spooks away because the food is coming straight to his face. <laughs> Barramundi's but, never seen a bait fish swim straight towards it for some strange yeah, reason. Nice. So I think what, when next time I'm playing with this a bit more, I've got to sort of remember the eyes are on top of the head as well. So keep the lure above the fish at mm. all times and then when it gets close to them rather than lower it to where you assume you're going to be to get a bite, try and speed it up, take it away from them. Um, I guess tease them a bit more with it. I do the same when I fish vertically for bass with gulp. Um, they'll, they'll track your lure. As your lure's going up, they follow your lure up. And then when you open your bail and your lure goes down, they follow it down. But what I'd like to do with them is as soon, uh, once they start following my lure up, I then change direction and start dropping down and it only takes about two or three times of you swapping direction when they change direction and they get really really pissed off and fly straight up and eat it <laughs> that's what we like to see hey we've got a question come through from brett he's saying so the screen doesn't actually scroll it's more like watching a tv yep basically what it is like an ultrasound so it does not scroll it's just it's a live view so but yeah, like you say it's like watching a tv so you can watch Everything real time. You can see your line, lure, fish positions, everything. No scrolling. I, I don't think I'd get as excited watching anything on TV as I'd get watching that on a screen. I got to tell you right now. And we spent two or three hours playing around with those fish before we realised we'd spent two hours playing with them. And catching them. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the danger with the uh, live sonar. Let's have a look at the next video, mate, and see what that's uh, showing us. So I think this fish hits me up the top in this one. Yeah, so that's my lure, smacks it, see him hit it, and then see him run for the hills. <laughs> I'm still twitching it, thinking he would come back, and he's gone. He's gone, yep. <laughs> that was one of the ones we actually got to hit. And a couple of them that we saw hit our lures like that, we never even felt it. All right. So we've got a few comments here. What are we saying? Screen's freezing a bit now. I think um, EJ might be having trouble with um, with the video that's coming through, so that might be a, a, an internet connectivity thing. Uh, so Christian's saying, can you run active target on the one unit with a three-in-one transducer plugged in, or do you need to unplug and plug in the active target transducer? And also, can you run split screen, active target, and side scan? Yep. You can do all of those things. So you can – it runs on a network. It doesn't plug in a transducer port. So the transducer plugs into the module and the module talks to your sounders with the, net, with the Ethernet. So, mm. yeah, you can run multiple transducers at the same time. Yep, cool, cool. And you can run any split screen you want. Um, so Mick Knowles is asking a side scan and down scan. What's the maximum depth that you fish? Uh, I haven't been anywhere over 100 metres, so... That's personal. I've had uh, down scan to 100 metres for jigging and stuff like that. Side scan, I don't think I've really bothered over probably even 50 metres or so because, and that's just searching for snapper ground. So, and it was, yeah, I was, I don't know, I think I even was shallower than that at the time. We might have only been in about 35 metres. Okay. Cool. All right, look, we've got one more video to watch. It's my favourite of the ones that you sent through, mate, so let's put that one on. 
and uh, you can walk us through what's going on here. So this is scout mode. As I said, you got a wide, wide beam, but very uh, hard to picture, like hard to understand depths of the fish. But you can see that barra move across the bottom of the screen into the weed towers. So all those real hot objects on the screen, the real bright ones, they're all the solid weed towers. You got a bit of a clear patch over to your right, and then all over on the left, you got more solid weed towers. So I like fishing this mode for barra because it's very easy to pick the path where you want to run a lure through. You see that barrow move through, you'll see your lure come through in a second. He appears behind the lure once, disappears back, and then as the lure pops out of the weed again, you see him chase after it. There he is again at the back. And then as this lure pops out in a second, he has one little little sneaky look at it and just disappears back into the weed again. <laughs> Might have been educated that one. I have to say, I'll play, you would I'll have play that video again, but... Um, the first thing I noticed was actually the shadow of the fish. And I, it wasn't until I watched it a bit more closely I saw the actual fish. You'll see the shadow go across the towel there. So, Yeah. And yeah. the bait, see the bait near him, the little black bits of yep. bait that were in the same yep. position of the shadow. All those yep. little white glow at the bottom front of the screen, like in the beginning of the wedge, all those little white stars are bait fish. That's all bait. Yep. Yep. Awesome stuff. And then that lure is a six inch paddle tail plastic that's come back through. So that shows how easy it is to see that lure, even yep. with all that weed, everything going on. Yeah. You'd think in shallow water with weed tails, it'd be hard to spot it, but it's not at all difficult to spot. There's actually another fish that takes off just at the very end of that video, right near the transducer beam as well. Let's bring ourselves back onto the screen here, mate. So a couple of other questions have come through. So Brett, asked a question about what transducer to plug into the um, HGI 7, but I think Nick Hamilton-Smith has already answered that for us. So thank you, Nick. I don't think it does, no. Yeah, HGS Carbon or HGS Live for Active Target? Yep. Correct. All right. And the Elite FS. And Carl's asking, have you learnt more about Barra since you've been using the Active Target? Yes, I thought they were frustrating animals before and they were way worse <laughs> than I thought. I had another video. We had it in scout mode in deeper water in Calai Dam and there would have been 30 barramundi on the screen at one point. And just we stopped, stopped watching it just because it got so frustrating. But I turned around and looked at the screen. There was three of us fishing and you could see three little lures coming back and there was four or five packs of barramundi and you watch the lure coming along and all the barramundi just part and the lure comes through and then the barramundi <laughs> comes back multiple yeah. times. So I haven't really had, I sort of get into this technology when the season is tough. So I got onto this sort of the close of season, the end of when the bite is slowing down and stuff like that. Um, I'm, I'm yet to understand whether when I'm catching 30 fish a night, is there more fish there or is it just that those 30 or 40 that are on the screen all of a sudden become active? That's the sort of thing I haven't haven't really worked out yet. Well, I haven't had the opportunity to fish when, when that's been going on. And I think that's a great opportunity now that this technology is more widely available is that you know, once we come to terms with actually how to use it, then it come, we have, we've got to come to terms with what's it actually telling us and what can we learn from it. And, and there's been a, a number of anglers that I've spoken to over the last couple of months who are using the technology saying, oh, I'm learning <laughs> learning not to stay on a school of fish for too long if they're not active and they're not, they're not biting because you know, you're wasting your time. But it's very tempting to do that when you can see them all on the screen. So there's a few things to learn, a few lessons to be learned, I think, as we go along. Yeah, and definitely. And it comes back to, too, targeting inactive fish, which I don't like doing. So... Um, there's a place where fish hang out and there's a place where fish feed. And with this, you're seeing so many fish everywhere. So before you go to cast, where you would typically cast and I'm trying to clip a weed tower or I'm trying to pop off a rock pile or whatever I typically fish in whichever lake I'm in, um, I find myself going, wow, there's 10 fish just right there. Like one of them has to bite. So I'm throwing over to them and then I'm throwing over to this one. And then he watched like two or three follow you into the boat. So you'll quickly cast again and you'll see him turn around. And you're just not, you're not converting those fish. And as we know, they're not 
active fish either, so they're difficult mm. to mm. You you mentioned know, you, you mentioned in the podcast that you almost use active target exclusively now. Do you want to talk a bit about why that's the case? Well, because it's not historical data. So I had side scan on in a particular lake and it was really shallow and I spooked a couple of like I went in there looking, thinking there should be some barramundi in there because it was warm. And um, again, later in season, so it's cooling down. Went in there to have a look and spooking barra with the trolling motor as I'm moving through, like I might hit a bit of timber or whatever and you'd see some take off. And side scan, because it's only about maybe five foot in there, and mm. side scan wasn't really showing me many fish, one or two here and there, that was it. And... Uh, I put the active target over and started panning around in scout mode and there, there was 20 something fish in there and there was packs of 10 cruising through as well. But literally the same scenario, they're only in there to get warm. So I could watch my lure coming back and I could time it perfectly with the fish coming across and you would watch them stop and wait until the lure was past their point of travel where they were going to go and then they continue to go again. So what I was doing was being a bit cheeky and stopping my lure knowing where it was on the bottom waiting for them to get close, then pop it up and start swimming it, and you just watch mm. it take off 200 miles an hour. I literally had one or two hits. And, oh, there's deeper fish in scout mode as well that I was talking about. You could literally wind your lure into them. So you'd be rolling it back, oh, yep, yep, I'm going to hit it, going to hit it, and you'd feel, you know when your lure comes over a branch and you get that heaviness in your line as you get mm. closer, closer, it gets heavier and heavier? You could feel that, and then dunk, you get a bump and you see the bar take off off the screen. <laughs> once once we had that happen on the active target a couple of times and watched it, it's incredible how many times that actually happens in a night. Like we had that happen a lot where we weren't even watching and it's like, that's that's a fish. And I actually tempted one where I must have banged him hard enough that it pissed him off because he came back and ate it. Right. So my mate was out, so I can't <laughs> believe that one did not hook up because it nearly took the rod. And as I said that, he turned around and smacked the lure, so he must have been really upset. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now, I've got a couple more questions, but I'm, I'm hoping that other people are going to ask some questions because if they don't, I'm going to start wrapping this up, guys. So a few more minutes, so we're going to keep Dean online. If there's some questions coming, we'll keep going. If there's no questions coming, we'll bring it to a close. But, mate, I'd like to talk about, um, you mentioned uh, in, in the podcast that you're looking for patches of warmer water at this time of year. Uh, we were talking specifically about fishing in Awonga, but I think this is pretty much the case in any empowerment at this time of year. How, how much warmer is warmer, mate? Does it have to be a couple of degrees or is half a degree enough? Or What, what are you oh, looking for? What's, what's the temperature change? Typically two degrees plus, I reckon. Like okay. Americans will talk about two degrees over there as well, which is Fahrenheit, obviously not as much. Mm. As it, so mm. that's, that's close to, closer to one. But his, historically it needs to be, that two degrees plus some some bays you might even find five or six degrees more like it can be in the main basin and it's 21 go around the corner in the back of a bay and you're looking at 27 sometimes especially in the in the arvos and that that makes a big difference quick question from shane here i reckon i know the answer to this one mate is is active target worth the money Depends how much hair you have because you uh, <laughs> can't pull a lot out in the early stage <laughs> watching all these fish till you work out how to catch them. But yeah, I, yeah, it's it's hard to say because for me it is because I like to understand what they're doing, where they're going, and just feel I feel anything that helps me understand them more. Whether like someone asked before, do you ignore the normal signs, the external signs? I'd say no. You just add this to it. Just gives you that much more information to help you catch more fish. And mm. depends where you live. Like some of the guys doing these big trips to go all the way up north from Victoria or somewhere, to have that technology on there's it's probably not the cheapest part of your holiday away, but it's it's definitely not the most expensive part of that trip. So why why handicap yourself without having it? Yep. Yep. If it gives you that edge, it gives you that advantage when you're on unfamiliar water, well, every bit helps. So you just feel more comfortable now when it's live you can look around and say yes there's definitely fish here i'm in the right spot I, i'm not wasting my time casting here yeah yeah so uh, tristan says he's in darwin where they have seven meters of run in the tides and how well does it do the images work in the, under those conditions well we fish hinton brook which i'm not sure they don't have as big a tides as that but they definitely have a massive tide change and yeah mm. that's it was perfectly for up there 
Yeah, and um, Brad Passfield's inviting you over to fish with him in Kununurra. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, De- Dean's been laid up with a broken foot, mate. So, uh, but uh, yeah, Any re- re- to me, re- right? reach out to him. Yeah, I got chase me. Right plenty of questions coming through. That's great, guys. Keep them coming. So, what's the optimal distance or range for the best picture in scout mode? Asks Christian. I guess it depends on what is in the area. You know, if you got weed towers everywhere. Um, you're obviously going to lose some distance, especially if they're really, really thick set. But I find the same as my structure scan, I don't go any wider than a, than a typical cast. I don't see the point. If you can't cast that far, then why do it? And so what I've also done with active target is probably brought it in even a little bit shorter so that it's easier to target them, you know. So I was chasing a cod around in Copeton the other week. There was He was over 60 feet away. And every cast, because he was moving so fast, I was literally landing my lure at like 55, <laughs> about five shots of him, and I had to chase him down to get him within 40 so I could land my lure on the other side of me. Yep, yep. Uh, this is a very good question. Josh Pierce is asking for any advice on how to convince the missus into letting him buy one. <laughs> buy one for her as a birthday present. <laughs> but my, my best suggestion, mate, is tell her how much money you'll save on fish. So, uh, is a, um, what's this, like Big Brother show for the fish? It's like a live thing. You get to watch them. <laughs> Doing their thing and behaving naturally. All right. So, uh, Mark Brett, with the active target, how much have you learnt between Barra and Cod in how they react towards lures? That's a great question, Mark, because that's what I was going to ask. Well, basically, like I was saying, I've still – hasn't really taught me a lot. It's – proven a few things that I already sort of knew that like fish if they can get a good look at your lure typically will just track it follow it look at it because they know it's not real they know something's not quite right especially in those times outside of feeding zones so you're forced to to introduce some sort of trigger like pop the rod twitch the lure try and take it away from something like that and then I've also same as I've said earlier it's fish have a feeding location and they have uh, resting location and when they're where they're resting they're not interested in feeding you can they just like i said they i was amazed how far away that in scout mode they would have been 10 or 12 feet to the side of my lure and they stopped swimming forward waiting for my lure to get out of their way so they knew it wasn't right for starters and then you go back to that same location later in the day when the water's warmer, everything's right, and those fish are maniacs. It's like completely mm. different kettle mm. fish. Yep, yep. Excellent. So um, question here from Aaron. Do you run your active target on 12 volt or 24 volt, and does it really matter? At the moment, it's on 12, but I am going to switch it over to 24 because, like I said, I'm pulling – I pull more current running the, the sounder setup that I'm using – to my 12 volt system than I am on my 24 volt running my Lorenz Ghost. So I was doing, I think I was on about 40% on my trolling motor, doing 4.1 amps. And on my 12 volt system with two sounders and active target, I was pulling eight point something. So I'm going to move mine over to my 24 volt system just to save my sounder batteries. Yep, yep, good move. All right. What else have we got here? So uh, Tim's asking about whether you've used it for inshore reefies and pelagics. No, nah, not yet. So my sort of inshore boat is all Simrad set up boat, so I haven't put it on there to to be able to do it yet. But, yes, I would love to, Luke, to use it on, especially um, like impoundment fish are difficult. It's not – most impoundment fish, it's not natural for where they are, so they're obviously moody and whatever else, whereas that saltwater species, reef fish, they're not quite the same. They're, they're there for a reason. Yeah. Do you get better results on a 12 versus a 9 due to the screen resolution? Resolution, not much the same, but you obviously the bigger the screen, the easier it is and the more you can set distances further out and stuff too because the image is physically bigger for you to look at. That's about the main thing. Yeah. I run a 9 and it's clear and I've, I've fished with my mate Kenny and he's with the 12 and I didn't see any different. 
Uh, I, I don't know, Josh. I'm not going to advise you on that one, mate. That sounds a bit dangerous. And to be <laughs> honest, I, I think buying a unit probably sounds like a cheaper option. So. <laughs> <laughs> Shane's asking about uh, whether you got a cod. No, that one that I chased around in Copeland. So it was, I had, I think, four casts at this fish and it was tracking at about 12 foot in the water and I was in 25 feet. And then I decided to speed up to get it within 40 feet. And I literally watched this fish come from 12 feet of water and just fly straight up to the woods of surf saying, look at this thing. And it came up and just blew up a ball of bait in the middle of the lake. <laughs> and it disappeared straight down to the bottom and gone. Yeah, yeah. So if That's I good. was, if I'd got in front of him, he was definitely an active fish, and he would have took a fish all. Mick's asking how your vibrating lure's going, mate. <laughs> it's not going anywhere at the moment because I'm stuck. <laughs> all right. Question from Jeff: Do you think that hammering in active fish will make the fish more open to new presentations, i.e., cod chatterbaits to swim baits to spinner baits? Not that I've noticed. Like I've found a few cod on a rock pile and we pestered them with a whole bunch of different things and I reckon it actually made them worse. I think, like I said before, and what another mate told me is you probably, if you find them all like that and you can see them sitting there like that, if you kept your distance, this particular video I was sitting directly on top of these fish. I think if I kept my distance and ran those lures above those fish to sort of spark curiosity with them rather than bombing them with all different things, it probably would have been a different response. Yeah. They definitely yeah. advise that. Those barramundi that we pested, they just got worse and worse and worse. <laughs> less and less shut less down. Any advice on fishing for bass in winter? Mick fishes landlocked ponds. Depends on what state you're in. So typically New South Wales anyway, and if these landlocked places don't have bony brim, the fish should be really, really shallow because all the bait fish should be really shallow looking for super warm water. Like down New South Wales, Glenbourne, Sinclair, those places, the fish are literally in. I've hooked them in there and they've had to flap on their side to get back out into deep water and fight you. They're that shallow. <laughs> Good clue there. Question from Shane about whether you've tried using live baits with the active. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have been in the salt that I would, but, yeah, I've only fished fresh water with it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Brad's asking if you know where the technology is going, what's its limitations in terms of beam width and thickness? I think you know, the technology is going to the point where we're going to be able to make a cappuccino with it before long, Brad, and it's probably yeah. going to catch the fish for us. But I'll let Dean give his thoughts on that. Yeah, I don't know where the technology is going either. What I, I would like to do and or see is run um, – like you're saying with beam thickness, that's the only limitation that I see. It is so accurate in forward mode, but very, very narrow. So I can, as long as, and the, and the best thing what I've learned from the COD guys is it's best to target those fish that are moving away from you because you know you're now staying in a consistent line with them. Whereas a fish that's traveling past, it's very hard to track that fish because the beam is so narrow. But if it's an active fish, um, the chances of him taking a lure, you don't. If you landed where you thought he was going to be anyway, he's going to turn around and go and smack that lure. Like they can see it from a long way away. Mm. Dean, one of the things that when I spoke to Steve Morgan a while back, he mentioned it's something unique to Barra, according to Steve. But when you see them in the um, in, in the scout mode, apparently you say turn towards you because of the shape of the head. They actually reflect the the beam away, and so they can disappear off the sonar completely but still be there? Have you discovered that at all? Have you noticed it? I haven't noticed it, no. I have okay. noticed it. Like, the beam is made up, even though like in scout mode in particular, it's 130, I think it's 130 odd degrees. It's mm. actually made up of three different transducer setups. So they do overlap, and that's the only yep. time I've seen fish disappear. So where those two cross over, you might see a fish as he's going from one beam who passes into the second beam, and he will appear to disappear for a split you, second. You'll get fractured. Yeah. Brad's asking a good question, as Brad always does. Uh, no, no, sorry, not Brad, Dick, I'm, I mean. We've we got father and son here tonight. Any correlation <laughs> between wind gusts on the water and fish movement that you've noticed? Definitely. In Pound Bay Monday, I like to fish the wind-blown side, but don't get caught out uh, fishing a southern bank when you get there on Friday night because there's a southerly blowing when it could have been blowing nor'easter all week. So, 
do a little bit of research on the wind or even just keep an eye on it before you get in there and see which direction it has been blowing. So that's that's the edge you want to fish. So the main reason for that is obviously, bear in mind you want, want food and it's like a chain, like the food chain, you know. So the smaller stuff, the tiny stuff gets blown across to start with and then the next size fish you want to follow it to eat it, blah, blah, blah. You end up, the barramundi end up following the bony brim. But mm. if the wind changes today, yes, that'd be a little bit harder to catch because they do prefer that disturbance and the, and the water from the wind and, as such, but they will still be there. Whereas if you jump over to the bank that has just freshly started the wind blowing on it, there's not all that activity and stuff that should be there. Yeah. Jamie's made a comment. How do you spend time on the screen instead of on the lure? <laughs> Every time he fishes, he spends doesn't spend time looking at the sounder. I think we talked about that a little bit earlier on that Dean – yeah, likes to keep a, a very close eye on what's going on around him and still uses the sounder as well. But you, you have to do both. You can't just rely on the sounder. No, you need it just to back up that information that you already know. All right. What else we got here? Tristan wants to know if you're going to come up and fish with him in Darwin during the wet season, mate. I've been asked by a few people to come up there and I'd really love to, but I don't know what happened. Something happened this year where I couldn't, and that was sort of the first year I was planning on doing it, so... Maybe next season. Next season, yeah. Have you compared the Lowrance Live to other brands and how do they compare? Uh, I did have a play around with Pern Optics uh, a while back just to see whether I was missing out on anything actually before the active target came out. And the only thing that I would say, not to, I don't like putting any other brands down or anything, but the only thing I would say is that Lowrance is definitely easier to follow your lure and stuff on scout mode. So I tried running the Garmin in that perspective mode, which is the same thing, like a, a wide view, because I really struggled understanding and trying to chase fish with the beam running this way on the on the Garmin as well, because it's a narrow beam similar. Mm. Uh, and their perspective is the same. You flitch over and, you, and you're running this way. And I could not find my lure running that way. But like I said, I only played with it, wasn't mine, and had it for two trips, you know, so it's really hard to... It's not like I ran it for a year and I've run this one for a year. You really perfected it, yeah. Perfect. Yep. So. Dick's just coming with some clarification. He meant with the wind gusts in terms of what you see on the live screen. Well, like I said before, we haven't really had a good session on the Barramundi with Active Target yet. Every time I've been there, it's um, definitely been difficult bite times like they haven't been doing their typ typical thing so but yeah definitely with with the breeze um sort of a unique feature in particularly calai dam area which is inland of the the bite windows are almost highlighted by the lack of wind so the wind will die off which is at the tide change sort of thing as you know the wind changes and and you'll actually catch more fish when when that wind backs off but you do need that area where the bait has already been pushed all up there. Mm. Shane wants to know about your fishing spots, mate. Where's your favourite place to have a flick? Oh, are we still talking about Barra Monday? <laughs> well, let's at, stick with Barra. This is a Barra session, so yeah. At the moment, my favourite fishing is GT popping off early, as most people would. <laughs> but yeah, my favourite place for Barra, that's a bit hard because you've got two things. So I like going to Calide just because I can catch a 90 metre fish one cast and a metre 20 the next cast. But I do like a longer because I can catch 30-something fish in, in in two or three hours of an evening, not to mention what you jump off. So, And a longer is, is getting there for those meteries now too. So it's this November is going to be really good. Yep, yep. All right, mate, we might make this the last question. It's coming in from Aaron. Do you move your, your pole? with your transducer on it from the front to the back, or do you have a preferred spot on your boat where you run it? So that was my plan. I've left, I mounted my box in the middle of my boat so that I could move it to the back if I needed to. But I found with my boat, and because you have it on a pole, I'm shooting straight under the boat with no problems. I'm not getting interference from the hull or mm. outboard. The only time I ever get interference is a trolley motor if, if I'm in forward mode and I'm basically pointing straight at the, back of it because i'm i've got up the nose so trolling motors here poles here that's the only time and, and even then it still gets enough information around it you just sort of have like a black spot in there but yeah we fish anchor mode with 
the pole at the front of the boat and just shoot straight under the boat in scout and there's no interference no, it's fine. no problem yeah to, it to the back just be able to because it's on a ram i was just going to unscrew it walk down and twist it back on down the back but there's no need you haven't, haven't had to yeah Excellent. Well, thank you for uh, answering all those questions, Dean. Thank you, everybody at home, for a great bunch of questions and some great participation tonight. Always makes it a lot easier to, to be here when people are asking great questions, so we appreciate that. Um, Dean, it's been tremendous talking to you once again. Thank you for, for tonight. Thank you for the podcast you did for me the other day as well. Uh, I hope it's going to help a lot of people with some barrier. Uh, mate, do you want to leave us perhaps with telling us how people can find you and your YouTube channel? And the very, I mean, YouTube's one thing. I think you've got a bit. 15 different social media platforms haven't you tell us where we can find you offline mate once we leave this session basically all my platforms are just my name so if you if you're an instagram person facebook person youtube twitter whatever you, whatever you're into um just basically search my name um most people that follow me will tell you that i'm happy to always answer any questions um my youtube channel is basically based around trying to help people catch more fish so when I was tournament fishing, spent a lot of time not really keeping secrets, but sort of keeping secrets, keeping things quiet, bettering yourself to try and beat other people. But these days I find way more pleasure trying to actually help people catch more fish. So anything that I learn, um, I try and pass that on as much as I can. I'm also not really like spots. I don't care about telling people spots, but I find that information sort of more use useless than helpful. I'd rather tell you how and techniques and times and stuff so that you can do it yourself, you know, rather yeah. than have this spot because the spot can be dead tomorrow or two weeks later or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, I was on your YouTube channel the other day and I was marvelling at how you'd answered every question or every comment that had been put on the videos that I was looking at. So that's what people, people, some people forget, you know, like social media is, is social and without all those people watching it, talking to me, doing that stuff, if I don't reply to them, then who do I have? You know, that's... yeah. Yeah. I'm there for them and they're there for me. Yeah, it's good for it to be a good for it to be a two way street. So thanks again, Dean. And and thank you also to the guys at Navicar, of course, for making these sessions possible and uh, and sponsoring them and keeping us coming along and sharing this information with you. And uh, we look forward to some more and obviously there'll be another one in a month's time. So thank you. Good night. Tight yeah, lines. Stay safe. <laughs>